continue tonight in Daniel chapter 5, and this is the story, of course the story of Daniel, but the story of Belshazzar. Now, I believe the Bible, I believe the books. The book of Daniel, like others, has come under attack at various times by many ungodly men. Even in the most ancient times, there were those that cast doubt upon the writings of Daniel. They looked for things like this. There was a time in the early church, in ancient times, when there were no documents containing the name of Belshazzar other than the Bible and the writings of Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian. And because of that, there were those who would say, and not only were there not writings that contained his name, known writings at that time, I say there wasn't at, at a time. Uh, not only that, there were some accounts of the fall of Babylon, some historical accounts, and they named the, the king, the Babylonian king, after Nebuchadnezzar to be a man by the name of Nabonidus. Okay? And so therefore we have the biblical record which talks about Belshazzar here. And we're going to read it tonight. And we know that Belshazzar promises Daniel something. If he's able to interpret the handwriting in the wall, he says, I will make you third in the kingdom. And then he sets him up underneath of himself. Always was always a curious thing uh, why he says third and not second in the biblical narrative. And so there were no documents until there's multiple documents. I don't have the names of them. I do have them here. That were uncovered over a century ago now. They are known as, here we've got a screenshot, the, the, the Bonadis Chronicle, <laughs> which is actually in stone, attributed to Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus. The Cyrus Cylinder, which was written by Cyrus the Great, who, was, who, who conquers Babylon, the Persian who conquered Babylon in this story. And then uh, the verse account of Nabonidus. And these explain that Nabonidus was king, but he had no interest in ruling. This is all background information. Nabonidus was a man who worshipped the, the moon god. It's in the English translation, it's spelled S-I-N. Sin, sin. I don't know. And he also was very interested in archaeology and religion, and he was off digging, and he placed his son Belshazzar in power and authority over Babylon. And the historical accounts tell us that Belshazzar was in fact killed. His father Nabonidus was not. He rushed back to Babylon and actually was given a position in the new government by the conquering Persians. So now you see that when they keep digging, and they keep finding that they always confirm the biblical record. Uh, archaeology and history bear out. The, uh, and we don't need that. We live by faith. We don't need that, but we see that that happens. So, let's begin tonight. I want to read just uh, beginning with the first four verses, an introduction. Belshazzar, Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar, that would be his grandfather, but the language says his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Those would be the, the holy things of the Hebrew temple. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God which is at Jerusalem. There it is. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine, praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. And these four verses set up the entire story for tonight. We have, we're done reading and studying about Nebuchadnezzar. And we know that in the end, Nebuchadnezzar went out of his mind but turns to praise God. And we don't read about him again after that. But here's his grandson. And he's placed in power. And the Babylonian kingdom was great. But at this very time, History records for us that Cyrus the Great was on the move. The Persians were conquering the world, and I mean, very successful at doing so. They had invaded almost every kingdom other than Babylon and Egypt. 
Cyrus never invades Egypt, but his son does and conquers Egypt. So the Persian Empire expanded greatly. Now sometimes we talk about this being the Medes and the Persians because Daniel talks about them in that way. And sometimes it's even called the, the Medo-Persian Empire. But in all truth, the Medes were conquered. And we'll find in chapter 6 that a Mede is placed over the kingdom, a man by the name of Darius. But we're not there yet. But in, in all reality, this is the Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great. Now with the danger that was at his door, and many of the historical documents record that there was some sort of a siege going on around Babylon. I mean, there, it was a time to fortify. It was a time to, to save on things to, of readiness. It should have been a time of preparedness, a time of defense, a time to set watchmen. And uh, I heard one, uh, Brother Stenabalu said one time that, that when he was feasting, he should have been fasting. When he was partying, he should have been praying. But we know that these are idolatrous men and worship false gods and the uh, multiplicity of gods and false idols. And, and no doubt by this time, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he had no idea who Daniel's God was, probably had no interest, and, and, and he was not cautious at all. Seems to throw caution to the wind. And he's living what we might call a, a lascivious life, a life of party, a carefree life, when he certainly shouldn't have been because there was trouble at the door. Trouble at the door. Nabonidus, his father, was an idolatrous king. After ruling only three years, he left for the, the oasis of T Tema and devoted himself to the worship of the moon god seen. He made Belshazzar his son, co-regent in 553 B.C. In the year 540 B.C., so 13 years later, Nabonidus returned from T uh, T Tema, hoping to defend his kingdom from the Persians who were planning to advance on Babylon. So they knew that the, that the Persians were coming. They knew that this was a mighty army. They knew that they had been successful in so many places. In 539 B.C., Belshazzar was positioned in the city of Babylon to hold the capital. That's why he was there. That was his duty. That was his job. But he makes a great feast for thousands of his lords, drinking wine before the thousand. Dr. B.R. Lakin described King Belshazzar as a pleasure seeker. And we often talk about how history does repeat itself. And I say the book of Daniel is timely. Not only timely because, yes, we'll get to talk about eventually the 70th week of Daniel and, you know, the end times. We're talking about history here now. To them, uh, what Daniel was foretelling was prophetic. Some of it going to happen that very night, we'll read. But history repeats itself. And so we see this sort of pleasure seeking in the last days. And Paul said that that would, that would denote and mark these days of apostasy. That men would be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of their own selves. Seeking gratification and fulfillment basically above all else. Even when there is great danger uh, at their door in the world today. Pleasure seeker. He held a great feast to entertain the elite members of his society. The Lord's. They drank wine in their presence. And I understand, you know, in the Bible, sometimes it's hard to determine what they're talking about wine, right? Sometimes it's just simply the word vino. It means vine. It just means grape juice, right? Or the fruit of the vine. But so, so we have to determine what are they drinking. I have no doubt that, that they're drinking whatever they can get, amen. This is probably an alcoholic beverage. They're being in excess. They're drinking it out of bowls, out of vessels. They're getting large vessels. And they go down and they take the vessels that they had, they had plundered from the house of God at Jerusalem to defile them. And, and they're having a party. They're having a party. The full extent of Babylonian wickedness is revealed in verse 3 of this chapter. Belshazzar had multiple wives as well as concubines for these parties. They praised their gods of gold, silver, brass, iron, wood, and stone. It was idolatrous. Many in America, many around the world today live after the same fashion. Get all you can, can all you get, my dad used to say is the attitude. And it's not just young people. As I say of young people today, it's not just always young people. Unashamed of the, of the, of the sin that we commit. Strong drink is flowing in America. Sexual perversion is accepted and embraced by many. And we see this story 
that should serve as a reminder that, that such a party, that such carelessness, that such wickedness can come to a, to a sudden stop, a sudden halt. You know, men mock at the idea of the judgment of God. And we would like, you know, we would like to think that it comes with some sort of a warning. But we have no idea of God's timeline. Not only do we not know when the great and terrible day of the Lord is, we don't know the return of the Lord. No man knows but the Father. We don't know anything on God's timeline. Even the, even the judgment of a nation like this, of a king like this, or an individual, or of you and I, because of our wickedness. God is gracious. God is long-suffering. We know that. But the judgment that comes here, I mean, they're prosperous. And they have gold. And they're, the, 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 they had conquered themselves. They had conquered many people. And we see the, the Hebrew captives. And they had all of this gold and all of this silver and all of the wine. Belshazzar had partied before and he was planning. A, a, this seems to be a rather large one. This seems to be so excessive. God was not sleeping or slumbering while the Babylonians lived and carried on in idolatrous wickedness. Often men's plans are changed or halted by God in a sudden and devastating fashion. Do you remember how that Nebuchadnezzar had learned that so painfully back in chapter 4? When Nebuchadnezzar, after it was all over, what did he say? He said, He doeth according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay His hand. Nebuchadnezzar learned that no one can affect the hand of God. No one can cause or prevent the hand of God. Let's read this. The hand. You ever heard that old saying? Boy, I can see the handwriting on the wall. If you're a Cubs fan or a Bears fan, you've heard that saying. I can see the handwriting on the wall. This is where it comes from. Sometimes we have old adages and we don't know where they come from. That one comes from this story. What does it mean? We see the handwriting on the wall. What a terrible, what a, what a night of terror this was. Verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. See, that never made sense. Until more ancient scrolls, ancient manuscripts were discovered revealing that Nabonidus was truly king and that Belshazzar was his regent placed in power and so by him placing anyone directly under him they would be third not second but third in the kingdom then came in all the king's wise men but they could not read the writing and not nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof then was king belshazzar greatly troubled and his countenance was changed in him and his lords were astonished or astonished and so we stop right there a terrible and frightening event occurs a hand appears it's not even a man. It's not even like an angelic appearance, but a hand appears and fingers and the portion of the hand that writes over on a plaster wall. I can imagine this. This is during the party. This is during, there's thousands and there's, there's no doubt music. There's no doubt all kinds of laughter. It's probably a loud place. And this hand appears. I don't know how large it was, but it was seen. The king sees it. A terrible and frightening event while well, the party's in progress. And... He doesn't know what to think of this. It writes, begins to write upon the wall. According to verse 6, Belshazzar was greatly affected, so much for, so much so, and he would be expected to be. It says his knees were smiting together. He was shaking. It affected his nerves. He was visibly changed and fearful. He had been moments before filled with pride. Now he's full of terror. His knees smiting together as he sits on the throne. He calls for all this. He does just what Nebuchadnezzar did. He calls for his wise men, his soothsayers, his magicians. All of the Babylonian experts were once again called to reveal and interpret God's message. The handwriting on the wall. But once again they fall short. None of them can help with the matter at all. As before in, in the study, none, none can help through the means of mediums or astrologers or necromancers or witchcraft 
The message of God remains hidden. By the way, we have the Word of God before us tonight, and without the Spirit of God within us, it, it cannot be interpreted either. That's why there's so much false doctrine. That's why there's so much heresy in the world. <clears throat> when, God, when God speaks, when God writes, when God declares and God decrees, men are without understanding. At their failure, the king is even more troubled than before. His countenance was changed. Strong says this word means his, his brightness and his cheerfulness. He was a pretty happy fellow right before this. He was laughing. Gaiety before the Lord showed up. But all the temporal joys were gone and his lords were in complete astonishment as well. And so Daniel is called. Verse 10. Chapter 5, verse 10. Now the queen, by reason of wor the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom. Oh, she had heard. There's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father hath made... Uh, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. She thought he was a soothsayer. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams, and showing of hard sentences, and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, his Hebrew name, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel, which art of the children of the captivity of Judah, whom the king my father brought out of Jewry? I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, and that they should read this writing, and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that Thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. <clears throat> then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself and thy rewards uh, to another. Give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. We'll continue there in a minute. So the queen comes in, and she's more familiar. You know, this tells you something. If she's familiar with Daniel, why is her husband not? Why is Belshazzar not? Her? I don't know if this is queen because it's his wife, or queen because it's his father's wife, his mother. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But why is he not familiar? He seems more careless than even she. It tells us the fact that she has to tell them this is a little bit more revealing about this man who's in charge. But he's holding a party while the, while the uh, Persians are at the door. She may have been, as I said, from an older generation. Speculation that it may have been his mother or grandmother when they call her the queen here. But she may, And so if that's the case, she may have known Daniel personally. She may have even been around when, when those things happened, when Daniel was younger and he interpreted the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar. But she, one thing's for sure, she was certain that Daniel could provide an answer, but we still see the idolatrous uh, nature of her words. She says, in him is the spirits of the gods. She doesn't know that there's one true and living God. One of the, one of the core central doctrines of the Bible is that there is but one God, the true and living God. He's, yes, he's king of kings and lord of lords, but truly there are no other lords. There are no other, no other glorious eternal kings. He is God. And there's none like Him. But she was certain that Daniel could provide an answer. She recounts for Belshazzar the history of Daniel under his forefather, Nebuchadnezzar's rule. It becomes obvious that Belshazzar did not yet personally know this faithful servant of God. Because when he comes in, he says, are you this Daniel? I mean, Daniel had been given a great place in the kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar. So had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But here by this time, this man, he doesn't even know who Daniel is. Are you Daniel? Are you the one I've just been told about? Daniel comes before the king. Daniel, who had been previously exalted under God's providence, maybe still holding a position of prominence within this large and prosperous kingdom. 
yet seemingly unknown to Belshazzar, who, who, who was uninterested in becoming intimate with God's people, uninterested in most things before the hand appeared against the plaster wall. One of his servants. That's all Daniel was before this night. History records that for about three months prior to this night, Cyrus, the king of Persia, had been laying siege to the city of Babylon. With an army at the city wall, it was a very careless thing to carry on in such a reckless gaiety into the night. Perhaps his confidence was in the walls, the massive walls that surrounded the city. These walls, according to the Greek historian Herodotus in the 5th century B.C., they were no less than 87 feet thick and 350 feet high. Those are, that's some serious walls. There were also 250 watchtowers which extended another 100 feet into the air. This was now, by now a familiar event to Daniel, being called before the king. He's no longer a young man. I don't know his age. But he had stood before the king before and he, was gonna, he would do it again. The king makes great promises. The same promises he just made to his own magicians and his own soothsayers. Great promises at the onset of the meeting. If Daniel is able to read and interpret the inscription, he'll be elevated. By the way, Daniel says you can keep all your stuff. <laughs> I don't need you. Hey, Daniel's not going to be bribed. He doesn't want the stuff. <clears throat> the depth of Babylonian idolatry is revealed over and over in the words of the rulers when speaking to Daniel. Recognizing the multiplicity of gods. And here again, when he calls him before, he says, I've heard that the spirit of the gods is in me. Spirits of the gods. Here's Daniel's surprising response. Daniel answered and said, Let thy gifts be to thyselves. Give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known unto him the interpretation. He does not desire the things the king might offer. Let's continue. Verse 18. Daniel, Daniel recounts for him Nebuchadnezzar's story, by the way, here in detail. He says, O thou king, verse 18, O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he slew. Whom he would, he kept alive. And whom he would, he set up. And whom he would, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses, and they fed him grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruleth in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. So he recounts the things that we preached about, we studied last Sunday night. And Belshazzar, I would like to hope to think that he was familiar with some of this. Continuing though, he says, O thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart. Uh, there's a reason he told him about the pride of Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying, you, you're the same way. Thou hast not humbled thine heart. Though thou knewest all this, but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. Thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him. So he's telling the hand is from God. And this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many, take all you farsen. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Take all, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So stop there. We just got a couple verses left now. As I said, Belshazzar knew of the previous events. Life would be much easier if we all learned from the mistakes that our fathers made. Or even that these biblical accounts that we read of, we see what happens when men are lifted up in pride. We see the warning. We see the warnings of judgment upon those who live to the flesh. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reach, reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We know this. Yet it does not seem to affect and change us many times. Belshazzar knew of the previous events. He says you know these things. It seems we must learn things the hard way if we ever learn them at all from God. Many of the Babylonians were no doubt filled with fear when God showed His hand to them through Nebuchadnezzar. But as always is the case among men, we, we too, we have experienced things in life. We have experienced things that sometimes serve as a bit of a wake-up call, a bit of an eye-opening, perhaps used by God to affect us. I believe He's providential. I believe He's working in my life. Sometimes we forget, we're so forgetful. Perhaps under the time of Nebuchadnezzar, there were many that questioned their life, their idolatry. I don't know. The time had passed. We see the condition of the kingdom on this night. Daniel recounts to the king the excessiveness of his life, accusing him in detail of the wicked deeds of, that were going on that very night, of following in the footsteps of his grandfather. Daniel is not hesitant to proclaim the full extent of the king's evils. Here in verses 18, uh, no, Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, I have a cross reference, Deuteronomy 18, 18. Uh, Moses wrote, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak, speak in my name, I will require it of him. There is, as Dr. R.G. Lee preached, there's a payday someday. Recompense is mine, saith the Lord. Men don't believe that. And someone might step outside and say, well, I'm going to prove there's not a God. If there's a God, strike me down with lightning. See, there's no God. Every man, John sees something in the Revelation. He says, I saw a throne, a great white throne, him that sat upon it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. He said, I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before him, those found no place for them. And that day, you won't get a choice whether or not you want to stand before God, but you will stand before God. The interpretation of the writing. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these words right. Many, many tickle you far some. Right? These were actually known. Well, they weren't known to these men, obviously. Daniel was multilingual. These were known Aramaic words. But they were not a full and complete sentence. So it may not have been that he did not recognize the words, but he just certainly didn't know why this was written. Many, many times. One, one word is repeated. The literal writing is this. Okay, I have the translation. I mean, we know what Daniel said. The interpretation. Just literally, if it was in English, it would be something like this. Number, number, weighed, divisions. And that didn't make sense to the king. Number, number, weighed, divisions. Daniel gives the uh, interpretation. He tells him, your, king, your kingdom... God hath numbered your kingdom. In other words, He's judged it. He's examined it. He's measured it in a righteous way with a righteous standard. You're weighed in the balances. Boy, I don't ever want to be weighed in the balances. I don't. I don't know if that's still a prevailing idea today or not. You know, I hope when I you hear people say, well, I, I hope when I die that the good outweighs the bad. And that is nothing to do with the gospel and nothing to do with scripture and it's not good theology it's terrible to hope for such a thing here's a man who was weighed in the balances thy kingdom is divided it's going to be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians now it's kind of a dangerous thing to give an interpretation like this you would think is Belshazzar going to carry out? Is he going to fulfill his word and elevate him? I mean, when he when he gave really bad news to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar followed through. Belshazzar does too, in the same hour. And maybe it was only for an hour <laughs> until Daniel's elevated again under the Mede Darius. But he's made third in the kingdom for all purposes. In the absence of Belshazzar's father, he's made second on that night. <coughs> So sometimes people ask this, many, many take all you farsen, but then when Daniel gives the interpretation, he says, Perez, 
Perez, which means division, is the singular form of the word euphorism, which means di divisions, Aramaic. So it's the same word. It's just a little different root when he, when he repeats it back to him. These words, though frightening, were senseless without interpretation. And so Daniel, Daniel without God, Daniel has no more gift than you and I, you or I do. But Daniel exercising his gift as God's prophet, as an interpretator of visions and dreams, fills in the blanks between the words on the wall and tells him God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. You came up, you came up short. And, you, and men always do. Thy kingdom is given, divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar knew that the Medes and the Persians were aligned against him and they were outside the walls. And Daniel says such a thing. What some, his, some of the historical documents that have been uncovered reveal, not all confirm this, the exact overthrow of the, of the kingdom. How did they overthrow the kingdom with, with these walls? Uh, so some of the documents say that Doc Cyrus had developed a ingenious plan to gain access to the city and overthrow the mighty Babylonian Empire by damming up uh, a, a waterway that ran underneath the walls. I don't know if that's true or not because not all sources confirm that. You can read about that, probably find information about it online. But if that's the case, then they came in right underneath the wall. But one thing I believe for sure is that what Daniel said was fulfilled. Now, I mentioned Brother Ballou earlier. In his own layman's interpretation of what the handwriting on the wall, what it said in uh, layman's terms is this. The party's over. Remember that? Yeah. He preached a message on it, I think, entitled that. He said that the handwriting came in on the wall and what it wrote was, the party's over. I'm not trying to make light of Scripture. We know Daniel's actual interpretation. But in effect, that is what it said. That is the message. And I worry for our generation. I worry for our generation that has no care, no thought for the morrow, no thought certainly for eternity, no worry about their own souls, seeking to gain the world at the expense of their soul. I don't expect a hand to appear on the wall. I expect Christ to return in judgment. Amen. On a horse. With a sword in His mouth. With the brightness of His coming. And I don't know when. I don't. But I do know that we don't necessarily deserve any warning. We talk about signs of the times and all those things. But... He's coming as a thief in the night. That day should not take us unaware, that's for sure. The return of the Lord. But the party was over. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, Proverbs 29 1, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Psalm 9 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. God is a righteous judge over the nations. He weighed the wicked. By the way, God died. We have. Matthew 24 and 25 always been fascinated with what we see as the sheep and the goats, but the judgment of the nations. I don't understand all of that, but I know He judges nations even in our time and throughout history. He weighed the wicked Babylonian kingdom in the balances of righteousness, and she was very wanting in His own time. He had, they had prospered. He had given them much grace, even in times of wickedness. God who had shown great more mercy towards generations of rebellious leaders would now divide their kingdom and give it to the Medes and the Persians. Matthew Henry wrote of this, Sinners are pleased with gods that neither see nor hear nor know, but they will judge, be judged by one to whom all things are open and known. And so the thing comes to pass. Verse 29, the end of the chapter. They commanded Belshazzar and they clothed Daniel with scarlet. Daniel was probably not impressed by it at all. Put a scarlet robe on him. Put a chain of gold about his neck. A big old gold chain. The things that impress men. Made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom that would make him right under Belshazzar. And in that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom. Being about three score and two years old. He was 62. Darius the Median. Belshazzar was true to his word. His promise was kept towards Daniel. 
even if for an hour Daniel was the third ruler in the kingdom, doesn't seem like he really cared. He wasn't concerned. His only concern was serving God. Cyrus the Great, the founder of the Persian Empire, conquered the Medes and unified the two Iranian kingdoms. By the way, that's where this is geographically, ancient Babylon. And by today, his tomb, Cyrus the Great, is worshipped and adored by the Iranian people. But as ruthless as he was, he wasn't like the, many of the militant Muslim factions of our day. He, wasn't, he, was, he was smart. One of the things he did when he conquered a people is he continued to let them practice their religion. That's not something that goes on today. That's not something that the Taliban or ISIS would allow today if they conquered people to allow them to practice their religion. He ruled from 559 B.C. until the time of his death, and the empire expanded greatly under his rule. Belshazzar was slain that very night in the attack. God's judgment in this case, while though delayed, not, not really because it's on his time, but seemingly from man's perspective, delayed long through mercy, was now swift in its execution at the appointed time that God had appointed Himself. As I said earlier, the historical account, his father was not slain, he was absent. And he returns, but the battle is over. Actually given a, a position within the new occupying government, which was also Cyrus's practice. This Darius, the Mede, he actually comes from a conquered people because the Persians had conquered the Medes. But the new ruler of the Babylonian kingdom was to be a Mede by the name of Darius, who's 62 year old when he comes to reign. Darius the Mede was the son of Ahasuerus. He is only referred to, by the way, Darius, is only referred to in the biblical narrative and that of Fabius Josephus, the Jewish historian, which at one time was the case of Belshazzar and Daniel chapter 5, but is no longer the case. This, whether it is or not, I don't know. Whether it ever will be or not, I don't know, and I really don't care. But may someday be confirmed as well by other historical documents that are discovered. That is the end of Daniel chapter 5. The handwriting on the wall, the party, is over. The judgment of God is certain. Let's stand together tonight for prayer.